As always, The Old Man of the Three is brought to you by our friends at Cash App. Cash App is the payment app. It is the most versatile payment app there is on the market. You can invest, you can save, you can send money, you can buy crypto. Whatever you want to do, I guarantee you can do it on Cash App. All right, let's welcome in Perk. <laughs> Perk. Let's go. <laughs> this has been a long time coming. I, I, I we've, had, we've had people straight up cancel on us. Now, I'm not saying you canceled on us, but trying to nail you down to get you on the pod has been problematic. It has, and I, and I apologize. <laughs> but you, you know what? Look, they screaming my name like they screaming <laughs> yours. So I got to work... <laughs> to work around your schedule like they got to work around you know what i mean and i'm like hold on i'm trying to get on the pod you know i've been trying to get on you know what i mean i'm trying to make it happen but you you know how it is at the network tommy sometimes uh there's been a couple days where i'm like hey perk can you do the pod today or can you do the pod tomorrow and he'll be he'll be like let me look at my schedule and he'll send me a schedule and it's obviously it's you know get up First take, Sports Center, NBA Today. Then it's like ESPN Australia, ESPN Tokyo. The like no bullshit. Even, no I, bullshit. I don't even know these things exist. <laughs> yeah. there you go, there He's you doing go. hits. Yeah. He's doing hits yeah. in other countries. It is true. It is true though that like sometimes when people say like we're busy, like we don't know what they're actually doing. Like with you, we just turn the TV on. Like we know what you're doing. Like well, we see well one thing about it is this, and you can ask JJ this, Tom. Like I'm going to send him my schedule. Like, I'm going to send it to him so I can show him, like, okay, this is what's going on. My schedule might look identical to yours, so you could know. And so I told JJ, I'm like, look, we can knock this shit out, right? We could do about three or four of them if we used to do it virtual. He's like, nah, we need to do this in open area, <laughs> open space. I'm like, cool. He's like, You have said that from the beginning. We were, about yeah. to fly, we were about to fly to Chicago to do it. It was literally like we were going to we fly, fly to Chicago. We were going to come up to Boston to during the Eastern Conference Finals. I was, I was waiting on y'all. I know. I know. <laughs> what, what happened? And then on top of that, we always talk about this because Perk and I probably talk two times a week on the phone. Mm -hmm. um, we always talk about the fact that you know he'll do his hits. A lot of times it's in LA, Conference Finals. He was traveling to San Francisco and Boston. Then he gets home. And he's basically got two days straight of AAU. Yo, 10 hours a day in the fucking gym. <laughs> 10 hours a day in the gym. Like, I'm in the gym. And and it's a good thing, right? Because you get to see your sons and you get to be there for them and see those moments, you know. And you don't want to miss it. But I'm in there like, man, I just got off a of red eye at 5 in the morning. And I'm at the gym at 8 in the morning watching some damn 10 year olds play basketball. You were you were in Miami this past weekend, right, for an I, AU tournament? Yeah, I was. I was balling at the beach. What, what, were you in Miami for any other reason? What, what you trying to get at, JJ? <laughs> I'm just asking no, you, no, were you in Miami no. for any other reason? Because I little birdie told me you had another thing going on in Miami. Well, I mean, I mean, I feel like all the time, I mean, you know, if you could kill two things at one time, why not? You know what I mean? I, I had to go down there for basketball anyway. It was Father's Day. Why not mix in a little business? And and what was that business? You know, messing with the dogs, my Frenchies. <laughs> <laughs> Your Frenchies. <laughs> my Frenchies. Yeah, you know, you know what was I'm saying? Was it like a Frenchy convention? No, it wasn't a Frenchy convention. <laughs> it was just me, you know, bringing two of my top quality dogs down there to Florida, you know, some meeting some new people, introductions, things to that nature. It was money plays. I keep telling everybody, look, the Frenchies moving better than real estate right now. <laughs> Real talk. You want to get into some money, get into the Frenchies. Did not know that. Did yeah, not know yeah, that. I'll tell how, you how did you get your start in media? Because I was playing against you for 12 years, basically. And then I turn around and all of a sudden you're on TV every day. What, what was the start? What was the genesis of this? Well, to be honest, it happened by accident. It really did. Like, you know how they have those 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 classes you could take in the summertime while you playing, I never took those. I never had interest in, in even being on TV or being in the media, but I always respected the media as a player. And so I always wanted to be the next head coach that was a big man that played in the NBA. Like that was my goal, because I feel like big men get disrespected a lot. Like you look around the league right now, all the head coaches are either point guards or shooting guards or, 
you know, some wing players that that's coaching right now. And I'm like, nah, I want to be the next. I want to be a big man, you know, a head coach that was a big. And so I said, you know what? Let me get my name and my voice out there a little bit, right? So I started tweeting, bro. No lie. I started tweeting during the game after I was forced to retire. I didn't retire on my terms. I was forced to retire. I mean, the phone stopped ringing. So I started tweeting one playoffs, and I was like, man, Marcus Smart, no, he shouldn't leave that strong side corner. That's that's the golden rule. Like, you shouldn't do that. And I just kept tweeting about little in-game adjustments. Like, you know, that was supposed to be an X on the weak side or that big was got to know to make that corner pass. And all of a sudden, I get a DM on Twitter from a producer – from Undisputed. He was like, hey, Perk, would you be interested in coming in on uh, Undisputed with Skip and Shannon? So I was like, hell yeah. So he was like, all right, cool. We'll, I'll get back with you next week. We'll take care of your travel. You know, you come in Monday, Tuesday, you know, see how it go, and we'll go from there. So I ended up getting this number, and I texted him my phone. Number. I texted him, and I said, hey, this Kendrick Perk is locked me in or whatever. He ended up getting the, the flight situated. So I go down and I and I do undisputed, right? So they're like, oh, we want you to stay an extra day. So I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So I stayed an extra day, flew home that Wednesday, and they was like, they reached back out and was like, hey, would you be interested in doing the remaining of the playoffs? So I'm like, for sure. Hell yeah, I, I'm kind of, I'm going to watch basketball anyway. I get to go on TV and actually talk shit about it. Like, that's cool, right? So I started off, I was hot. I was I was right about everything, making bold predictions. Shit was just falling my way, all right? Then ESPN sent me a DM, DM like, hey, you want to come do the uh, car wash at Bristol? <laughs> they sent you a DM? Yeah, they sent me a DM. I just love that everyone just this, sends this, you through this, Twitter. <laughs> yes, this all happened. My career started on, on Twitter. Twitter. So they sent me a DM on Twitter. It's like, hey, you want to come do the car wash? And I was like, what the hell the car wash is? They was like, oh, well, you come to Bristol, you do uh, the Get Up Sports Center. I'm like, hell yeah. So I go to Bristol, and I remember my first time on Get Up. I, I, go, I, I go on and I say, you know what? Kawhi Leonard mimics Michael Jordan, and the shit went viral, right? I wasn't saying he was Michael Jordan, but if you watch his game, he do mimic Michael Jordan, right? And so then all of a sudden ESPN started calling me back. So now I'm not even thinking about the coaching shit no more. I'm like, look, I'm falling in love with the TV. They loving me. I'm a guy speak with broken English. They don't give a damn. I'm authentic. I was the only person that ever did first take and undisputed in one day. And first take was like, you know what? We can't have that no more. We're going to just lock you in for the remaining of the playoffs. I was like, no, nah, you can't do that because I was working for free anyway. What? What, at what period did you become? We're gonna get into some specifics, but like, at what period did you become comfortable talking critically about your guys? Because these are like your brothers who you played with forever. You know what? It, I I just started talking about them. Period. So here's the thing: the same perk you see on television is the same guy that I was in, that I was in the locker room. So like, I would say the same thing to like the guys for us holding them accountable. And me and Kevin Durant fell out, right? We went from being best friends <laughs> to him playing at Golden State. And when he tore his Achilles, I remember going to his house because I was out there working the game in the finals. I mean, when he had the calf strain. And I was like, I went to his house and I was like, look, bro, you don't have a damn thing to prove. Shut it down. It's no, no reason for you to even be playing. You're a two-time champion, two-time finals MVP. So what did he do, right? He go out there and play, right, and end up tearing his Achilles. The next day, I go on TV and I fire Bob Myers up. Yeah, Bob Myers put pressure on him to play. <laughs> I go in, right? I spill all the beans that I wasn't supposed to say that, you know, that they told that, you know, I was supposed to keep in-house, but I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just speaking my mind and taking up for my boy. I didn't really give a damn about Bob Myers. I was just pissed off that, you know, KD was out there playing and he shouldn't have been. It's a fine balance that I found because, because we're so um we're so new to the media 
And it wasn't that long ago that we were playing with and against our peers, people we respect. Um, it's a fine balance to be critical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, <clears throat> a great example of that is the day Pat Bev came in. And it just so happened to be the day after Chris Paul and the Phoenix Suns lost in game seven. Right. And Pat Bev was on one that day. <laughs> it was like his, his, you know, his mortal enemy. Mm hmm had just shit the bed, which Chris did, and I said that multiple times. But then Pat kind of like kept going with it. You right. know, he maybe took it maybe of too far. And so I think the challenge for us is finding the balance of being critical and being truthful, but not inserting our own bias into things. Right. And of course, we're all biased in some way, right? We're, our, our opinions, are, we can be opinionated. Right, right, right. And that's Absolutely. formed by our experiences, but we can't be opinionated based on our relationships. Does that make sense? No, that makes a lot of sense. And here, here's the thing that I've learned too, right? You have to be yourself, right? Don't go into, don't come into this media space trying to be something that you're not, all right? So the thing I love about you is that JJ came in, you're authentic, right? You don't give a damn. You will call people out on their bullshit. But then again, you also go back to numbers, right? Numbers and facts. And that's how you voice your opinion, which I love, right? But me on the other side, I'm not really good on numbers. Hell, I'm not even good at reading. I'm just a, I'm great at watching the damn game of basketball. Okay, that's what I do. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna just be me, right? And once somebody told me the E for ESPN stands for entertainment, that was the wrong thing they could have said. Because every day I go on there is to entertain the audience. So you wouldn't imagine, right? How many old people, middle aged people that I see from all nationalities come up to me and say. I just love how you keep it real on TV. I just love how you talk on TV. Because remember, we do have to touch all areas, right? You have people that understand basketball. You have people that understand PR, 50, 40, 90, uh, 85 points per possession, uh, per 100 possessions, <laughs> whatever that shit is, right? But then you also have that group of people that you have to just break down the game and simplify for it. Like, and just say, hey, man, this is what it is. He got cooked tonight. I'm not saying you and I are polar opposites, but there is a there is a little yin and yang with us. I remember, I got to tell this story real quick. I got to tell this story real quick. What you say is a little what? <laughs> yin and yang, you know? <laughs> uh, I got to tell this story. So this was probably fall of 2020. I was back from the bubble, and I hadn't gone down to New Orleans and I don't know how you know Ryan Price and not how you were on the Zoom call, but one of my high school friends, a kid I grew up playing AU with from Roanoke, Virginia, Ryan Price, lives down in Louisiana, and he hold, held this uh, coach's clinic I on Zoom. That. I remember that. And there was probably 90 Division I coaches, head, you know, head coaches in, in women's sports, uh, men's sports, uh, high school coaches, like – it was, a, it was a good mix of people, and it was you, me, and Tyrus Thomas. And we get at the, end of the sh at the end of the thing, and this women's basketball coach asked us about analytics and advanced stats. <laughs> and you're like, you basically were like, I fucking hate advanced stats. I don't believe in them, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I need the eye test. And then I'm like, I'm sitting over there like, oh, I got to go next. I got to go next. I don't know, like, because I, I believe in them. Right. And I believe in the eye test too. And that's where I think the yin and the yang thing is like, and I'm not saying you don't understand analytics. You don't use them the same way that I do. No, no. And look, I, I really don't understand them <laughs> because it's too much to be honest, which I really don't. So I, I don't even try to understand it. Like, I think that's why I say you got to be yourself, right? Like, I, I don't want to be the one that come in and try to be someone that I'm not, right? And like, People was like, oh, man, try calling the game with J.J. I'm like, hell nah. I stay in my lane until I find the exit. J.J. is great at all those areas. Like, you're really good and great at breaking down the game where you talk about guys, you know, getting beaten to pick and roll, the percentages and things to that nature, and I actually love that. But, you know, 
I look at this, right, and I look at the overall quote unquote new media, right? I look at I look at Draymond who does who does a great job with his podcast and break. Are you beefing with him too? Who? Draymond. I Is there a beef right I, now? I right? wouldn't call it beefing. I mean, we just, you know, we don't see eye to eye. Okay. Like, I'm not, at, at this stage of my life, okay, I'm 37 years old. All right, I'm 300 plus pounds. I'm eating good. I'm not beefing with nobody. Like, I'm past that. I can't let nobody disturb my peace. I'm going to sleep every single night with the AC on 60 and the fan blowing in my face. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm not I'm not beefing with nobody. Like, Dr- Draymond is great, but I love his competitive nature. Like, he's not going to shut up. I'm not going to shut up. It was part of it. But, again, I don't want him to change. Continue to be who he is, right? Be outspoken. Be a guy that call people out, whether it's me for being wrong on predictions or whatever the case may be. I don't give a damn. It's part of it. Did you ever have a prediction that you regret? Yeah, I have a few of them. What's what's the what's number what's, <laughs> what's number one? Few of what's them. number one for you? I right mean, now? like, so you know, like I know, right? Doing first take, that show in particular, you know, it's a debate show. So when when you when you're prepping for it, it's all about where you disagree at. Mm-hmm. To make great TV, it's take a, it behind the curtain, right? We get we get the we get the email the night before the show, yeah. And and obviously, if there's a, if there's during the playoffs, if there's a game, they're going to say we're going to hit you up in the morning, right? Then we, we wake up at six a.m., six thirty a.m. There's another email. There's a production call at seven thirty. There's the final email. Usually comes across at nine, and they go. They, they might have thirty questions. They whittle it down to five or six things that we all disagree on, so that we can talk about it. So and we discuss can talk and debate and debate. So sometimes. I may play devil's advocate and say, fuck it, right? And I remember it was last year, the Phoenix Suns jump out on the Milwaukee Bucks 2-0, right? And so I'm getting ready to go on first take the next morning. And they like, hey, Perk, would you sit up here and, and, and say that the Phoenix Suns are on the verge of being a dynasty? <laughs> 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 and so, so my big dumb ass, I'm like, Fuck it, hell yeah, I jump out on the limb. They about to win this series anyway because at that point it looked like Phoenix was the better team before like Giannis flipped the script. So I jump on first take the next morning and I was like, when I look at Devin Booker <laughs> look at, and I look at Mikael Bridges and I look at, you know, DeAndre Ayton, not just those three. Forget Chris Paul. They have the core. They have Monty Williams. They have the coaching. They go win this one. And in the next three or four years, they go win two more, which is going to make them a dynasty. I just jumped off the porch. They end up fucking losing the series, right? So it's no more dynasty. People still bring that shit up to this day. That's what... I think is it's not difficult because talking about sports like it's it, on television and getting paid for it like it's not necessarily like a real job. Let's be honest. Yeah, like it's not that it's <laughs> difficult, but the difficult thing about the job is uh, everybody keeps receipts. Mm-hmm. Everybody keeps receipts, and you can have a very well articulated, well informed, well researched opinion. But if that opinion does not vibe with a certain fan base, you are fucking the worst. Yeah. I, it, and, and it's like, I, that's what I found. Bro, I see it. you. I, I look, you know, the my favorite app, social media app, is Twitter. I don't go on Instagram. I don't have Snapchat and Facebook and all that shit. I'm on Twitter. And I just look. And I didn't, I didn't saw you a couple times. Matter of fact, I saw you a day ago. You engaged with somebody. I was and, engaging all day today. Yeah, I'm exhausted. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, see, that's what I'm talking about right there. And a part of me wanted to jump in. And I was like, you know what? I don't even feel like getting in this bar fight today, like with these people. So I'm just going to watch you interact with them. Because, I mean, but it's part of it, right? Like, just think about it. What people don't realize is this. This is what I, I figured out. Good and bad engagement is like, what the head people at ESPN want. So even if you engage with the content and you may say, look at this clown with this bullshit take, guess what? They want that. That's a click. Yeah. That's a click. I think the, I think the hard part for me <laughs> that I've found is, it, is trying to navigate 
and like I haven't been perfect with this by any means, but trying to navigate praising a player while not discrediting another player. And even when I feel like I've done that really well, it's inevitable that when I praise one guy either over another guy or don't even mention another guy, then I'm a hater to the guy I didn't mention. Right. That's the part that's just so frustrating at times, right? But you, I mean, you got to do it. (laughs) You got to do it. Like when the GOAT conversation comes up, you know, it's going to be LeBron and Jordan and <clears throat> let's I, actually let's actually talk about this for a second. I want to talk about uh, this. This is this is because the finals just ended. Obviously, Steph finally got his uh, finals MVP. I should have. I thought he should have won in 2015. I've said that 57 times. Um, that was the one thing ris- missing from his resume. You and I did a thing on Get Up maybe two three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. If if Steph wins the finals MVP and goes off against the Celtics, where does he stand on the all time list? You had him on Mount Rushmore, right? I do. You, 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 and that's fine. Yeah, and I, and I think I said he's already a top ten player to me. If he wins the Finals MVP, he's close to Mount Rushmore. Right, right. And of course, because I said that, right, I'm a Steph hater. Right, me saying a guy is a f- top five or seven player of all time makes me a hater. Right, <laughs> right. That's the part that's so nonsensical to me, though. Like me, pr- I'm praising a guy versus another twenty guys. Who probably could make a, a claim to be a top ten player of all? That's the problem when we talk about the greatest players right now. It's like, you know, we we we've talked about this a bunch of the pod. Like, I made a mistake and I I had Giannis outside the top three, right? I made the mistake. I owned it. Whatever. It was bullshit. But I'm like, there's five guys, six guys you could say are top three. Right. Any given year, there could be twelve guys that are top eight to you ten. Also, and you also made the mistake sitting next to Joel. <laughs> yeah. And we had and we had KD on the show. Three days later, so like there is some, there's a little bit of context to it. Yes. Yeah, but I could see, see, I I could see, I could understand how you forgot about Giannis, because he do it so much. It's almost like it's the norm, right? It's the new norm, and sometimes we could almost uh, forget to appreciate his greatness. Like, oh, Giannis just over here averaging thirty and twelve, no biggie. Because we see the new shiny toy. Year after year. Yeah, after year. After year. So we see the new shiny toy that's popping up like a Jason Tatum, a John Morant. And then you had DeMar DeRozan who took off out the gates who was up there as far as a front running MVP. And we just forgot about Giannis still over here just putting up monster numbers. It wasn't your fault. A lot of people did that. A lot of people did that. They just called you out on it. Because they was, you know what I'm saying? You got to understand this though. You got to understand this, though, JJ. You call a lot of people out on their bullshit. <laughs> so, so people are waiting. Listen, people are waiting uh, people to are get you slipping. And that's the thing that's you the brought thing. up. That's the thing you brought up, though, when you first started talking about your your early uh, foray into media is like, yeah, you get a positive response. And I'm well aware, like, there are people that have had a positive response to whether it's the podcast or ESPN. I'm also aware it. People are, anytime you have any level of like, I'm not going to call it success, but any level of like praise, then there's a whole nother group of people who are like, I can't wait for this motherfucker mm-hmm. to say something wrong. Yep. I'm going to get him. Yep. <laughs> that's, and that's how it is. And, you know, they was like, because a lot of people gave me a lot of, a lot of shit about, oh, yeah, man, you said Steph is on the Mount Rushmore. And I was like, okay, and I stand by it. I said, He's the greatest little man to ever play the game of basketball. He's the greatest shooter to ever play the game of basketball. He changed the game of basketball forever. Forever. Shots that he that he has like like he started to take and now set the ball for the rest of the league that's okay now to take would have had guys sitting at the end of the bench. And so I'm looking at Steph and I'm looking at the way that he has changed the game, made guys around him better. It's almost like a plug and replace. And it's no disrespect to nobody, but you you he went with Harrison Barnes. He went with Kevin Durant. He went with Andrew Wiggins. Like, it's the effect that he had on the game and has on the game. And I'm like, look, when it comes down to pure skills, he might be the top five greatest, like, 
skilled player to ever play the game. I don't even think that's – I mean, I would put him past top five. He's higher than that to me. I, I, well, I, be careful now. No, no, no. But <laughs> I, I, here's a hot take, and there's probably a lot of people that would probably get upset at this, but I, I've spent a decent amount of time over the last month watching um, – you can find full game highlights – of finals games from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Here we go. You go back and watch that shit? Oh, yeah. Here I spent two hours. Bro, I spent two <laughs> hours one day watching the 1987 Game 6 finals between the Celtics and the and the, um, and the the Lakers. Why? 81, Why? 70, Why? Oh, no, Houston no, Rockets Jose? versus Celtics. Why? Why? Because I, I don't buy this like the game was more physical. I buy that there were harder fouls and and – uh. You didn't get suspended for hard fouls, and the flagrants were different. I buy all that, but in terms of the actual gameplay, uh, let, me, uh, let me tell you. Instead of going, watch there was an era in the nineties that was different. It for was sure, different. But that they, was different. They wasn't as skilled. Instead, of, look, I'm gonna tell you something, JJ. Instead of watching, going back and watching all those old ass clips, all you have to do is listen to Isaiah Thomas. Okay, Zeke. He's the one old school cat that keeps it real all the time. They had a lot of people that were saying, oh, Giannis wouldn't be doing what he's doing right now back in the day. You know what Zeke said? Giannis would be tearing their ass up like he is today back then too. Well, my, my, my take was, and, and after watching you know, hours and hours of all these final escapes. <laughs> I feel sorry my, my, for my, your my, I know, man. I'm a sicko. <laughs> well, I love basketball, bro. I don't know what to tell you. But um, my take is that, I really believe this. This Warriors, whether you want to call it a dynasty or not, I don't know what the definition of dynasty is, but certainly, you know, four championships in eight so, seasons, six finals appearances in eight seasons. Like, I would call that a dynasty. But it this, is. This, like, trio, and we can throw the, the three years with Kevin Durant in there. I really believe that they would be as good as any team would have a chance to beat any team historically because of the way that they play. You put a three point line out on the court in any era. And that team is as good as anybody. I agree. I agree. Because I, I honestly believe, I thought the Celtics were going to win this series. And I bring this up to say this. I did too. The Celtics had, statistically, they had one of the best defensive teams in history. And I watched what Steph did. And what Steph did to that defense, along with Andrew Wiggins, Meaning, watching him play both ends of the floor, I'm like, okay, the way he's playing offensively, that's a reflection of the culture. The way he's playing defensively is a reflection of Draymond Green and his leadership. And then I'm watching Klay Thompson and all these guys, and I start to think about JaVale McGee. I start to think about Harrison Barnes. I start to think about guys that are not even in the NBA no more. Right, that played on those championship teams. Sean Livingston. No, 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 no. I'm I'm talking, no, not the old heads, JJ. I'm talking about the guys that actually still had something left in the tank. Uh, I believe the young fella, Patrick uh, McClaw, McClaw, that went to Toronto. He's not in the league no more, but on Golden State, he looked good. It was another. Player by the name of uh, Ian uh, Ian Clark. Ian Clark. Yeah. Look how he looked when he played with the Golden State Warriors. You know what I mean? And so when I think about that, I'm like, this culture may have been one of the greatest culture, if not the greatest, in NBA history. I agree with you on that. And it's Steph. It's Steph. It's, but it's, it's look, Draymond compliments Steph. Clay compliments them. You know the Kerr system that he put in when he when he came over in 15. Like, all that matters, but it's like – and I always, I always say this when I talk about Steph. In, in my era, your era, there's like three anomalies when I talk about superstar players mm-hmm. that are just like no drama, culture is real, they're about their business, they're competitive. It's like Tim Duncan, Giannis, and Steph. Right. Those are the three guys. Right. There's never any drama with them. No. They just go out and play. Everybody loves playing with them. Everybody loves being around. It's just it, like LeBron. I'm not. You played with LeBron. We'll get to that in a second. I've heard he's a great teammate. I've heard he's a great teammate. He there, is. There's, there's whether it's the media, the attention, uh, you know, the the rumors about the G, GM. Like there, there's, there's something there. I don't know what it is. You played with them, but with with Steph, Giannis, 
Tim Duncan, there was never anything there. There right. was never anything there. It, it was never, it's never nothing there because the one thing I heard about Steph is that, and I heard this from two guys that played with him, um, I believe what worked out with him, Amar Stoudemire and Brian Scalabrini, right, the white mama. He was like, he talk, he tell his AAU kids that his, his son on his son's team, hey, if you want to watch somebody to be great, don't watch LeBron James, watch Steph Curry. And I thought he was just like so full of shit and just being a hater of LeBron until I really realized, and this year really woke me up about like he's so much in great shape. And just because he don't publicize what he do or he don't talk or leak stories that what he's spending on his body and things to that nature, I'm talking about Steph. We don't give him credit for that. But like he didn't put on 10, 15 pounds of muscle. He has to do all that running around on the offensive end. He's become a good defender. Yeah, we're talking and about we talk become about a, Yeah, defender, and yeah. it's like it's like why are we not sitting back and not acknowledging what this guy has done with his temple and his body to 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 play at this high level and take this physical beating that he do night in and night out by guys that's bigger than him. Because see, like all the Golden State Warrior fans, for some reason they think I'm a hater. Like, I'm not a hater of Golden State. All I said was is that Steph could be held accountable at times, right? I, I mean, like, you know, he go through bad stretches, nobody said a word. And I'm like, why we can't call him out, like, and say he need to perform better like we do every other player? Like, we give him a pass, and it's not that we hate him, because as soon as he do something well, I'm going to congratulate him. Is there another player, and I'm curious about – the 18 Cavs team in particular, but just you've played against him a bunch over the years. Is there another player who's as deflating to your team when he starts going off as Steph? No. No. Because it's, it's the shots that he hit. Like, you're like, oh, that's a bad shot. And you sitting in, like, literally, you know you have, like, the, the pregame and you 60 on the clock. And you're going over the personnel, and they like, hey, look, the pickup point for Steph Curry need to be half court. But you watching the shit on on the TV, and you like, this is a bad shot. He's not gonna hit that tonight. And then all of a sudden, he comes out and he do it to you, right? You don't think it's true until it happened to you. And it's just those daggers, man. Like coming across half court, you know, having that much room and barely getting his shot off over seven footers. And it's just it's draining. It's a reason why you why like KD wanted to go play with Steph. It's a reason why you hear LeBron James saying, It's one player I want to go play with, and that's Steph Curry. You think they just saying that? No. Like There's a there's a contagious joy. There's a contagious <laughs> joy. No, I mean that. No, real talk. There's a contagious joy that he plays with, and it permeates the team. And I think that's a big reason those guys you mentioned, like that culture is so inclusive. It's so joyful. I see. I don't know when he's being sarcastic, being dead and I don't know when he's, he's real. Being serious. He's, I know he's. Serious. I know he's serious right now. I know. I know you serious right now. But it's that. It's like that different personality of JJ when he kick in. It's that contagious joy. It's that <laughs> Contagious joy. Hey, you know what? You know what I was. You know what I was telling my. I called uh, you one night. I called you one night, and bared my soul to you at like one thirty in the morning and after I listened, a game. And, and I you listened. listened. I listened. And you listened. That's what. That's and you're what, gonna fucking make fun of me right now? No, but it's a, it's a great <laughs> thing. It's a great thing. Hey, look, no lie. I was telling one of my boys was like, "Hey, man, when you get a chance, tell JJ to come down to Texas, right?" And it was. I was like, "Listen, one." I don't know if J.J. go ever come to Texas. He might come to Houston. But two, he's not coming down here to country as Beaumont to come to the hood. And so I had it, it made me start to think, right? And I was like, J.J. Reddy, right? You never know. Because I, I, I never knew you was this cool, right? The only, like, cool-ass white boy I ever played with was, like, Nick Collison. He was cool than a motherfucker, best teammate I ever had. And then all of a sudden I met you and I'm like, this motherfucker is really, really cool, dog. Like, 
You speak your mind. You know what I'm saying? You got a great sense, sense of humor. You a real motherfucker. You all right with did me, you, JJ. Did you guys oh, have, how that shifted quickly. Did, Thank you have you any, did you have any run-ins before you became friends? No. 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 I mean, he blocked my shot a couple times. I, like me and JJ. JJ yeah. never said a word. Like, well, we was always, I mean, he just competed. He just competed. We just competed against each other. Me I didn't him, talk shit in the NBA. You never did. I didn't talk shit you in the NBA. You just played hard as fuck. Yeah, I didn't talk shit in the NBA. Did you really grow up on a farm, by the way? I did. You did? I did. So, just so you know, like, I, I didn't grow up on a farm, but I grew up in the sticks. Like, I grew up in the sticks. I didn't have a neighbor till I got to the NBA. Really? No, we always lived out. You know what I mean? We lived out. My, my dad liked to have his garden, his land. Uh, you know, at one point, like, we lived on a farm with like four other families. Like, yeah, I, I, I'm, we didn't live on like a, a functioning farm. Yeah. <laughs> like, I lived out, man. I lived out. That's Tell me about the farm you grew up on. Well, I grew up, I was raised by my grandparents. So we had like 400 chickens and ducks, okay? Like six cows. Fucking had a goat, a couple, a couple goats. And, and like, it was literally so my job every day was to go out and pick fucking eggs. Like I had to pick eggs. Right now if you put me in a room with a chicken, I could kill a chicken, have it ready for you to cook in 30 minutes, literally. Like I could catch a chicken with my hand, wring his neck, put it in a hot pot of water, and have it ready for you to cook in 30 minutes. Seriously, you know how to cut it and everything. But I grew up on the farm, but it taught, it taught me life skills, bro. And it taught me how to like grind and work for what I wanted. And I think that was the best thing that could have happened for me because I actually had chores. Like, and I'm not talking about chores like, oh, clean your room or little things to that nature. I actually had real chores, like going out there and, and you know, having to go get eggs or, you know, pick the right eggs, not knowing if this hen is sitting on her eggs for a reason and she's mad today and might want to get on your ass. Like, I had real, like, chores shooting squirrels so they wouldn't eat up pecans out the pecan tree so my grandmother could make pecan candy and stuff to sell for 50 cents so that's how we made our income because my grandmother my grandmother was a maid bro so she dropped out of school when i was like in the sixth grade i mean when she was in the sixth grade my mom was shot and killed by her best friend my dad bounced when i was five so i was raised by my grandparents and my grandmother made like 40 dollars a week you know what I mean? My grandfather made $320 a month cleaning up the church. The house we lived in had like, a, like a, it was a crib with like, the ceilings was six two. That was built by my grandfather. So like everything I had to like learn and I had to go grind and get it out. That's why I had the mentality I did as a player. Like I got to grind and, and get dirty like to continue when, to survive in the league. When did you grow? When did you get? When did you so get? so, I had this growth spurt. I was like five, seven, in the fifth grade, and then I grew to like six one in the sixth grade, and I really didn't grow in the seventh grade. And in eighth grade, I was like six six, and then when I got to the ninth grade, I was six nine and a half, which I'm still six nine and a half, and I just stopped growing. I just stopped growing. I never reached six ten seven foot. I just stopped growing. When was the first time you dunked in a game? Seventh grade. Do you remember the dunk? Yeah, yeah. I got on the fast break. They threw it up, caught it, a pound dribble, drop step, hung on the rim, swung and shit, <laughs> fingertips, valley hanging on. But I remember that at Oldham Academy with a court, like the court had the carpet floor. I remember that. Yeah, like you, it was yesterday. You played, you played, you played against Braun and CP in AAU, but you were like playing with them or what was Yeah, the I actually, I actually, Kick LeBron ass in every tournament we played against the Houston Hoops against the Ohio Shooting Stars. This is this is records, okay? We had a team, me, Andy, Eby. That's really all we needed at the time. But we always met up with LeBron James in the championship, and I always won every single time until the one year we played together with the Oakland Soldiers, me, him, and Leon Poe. And I think that's probably when they made that. 100 mile radius rule at mm -hmm. one point where you couldn't do it because we teamed up for a few tournaments. Did you did you play at all with Marcus? Did you ever play up with Marcus Pierce? 
No, I did. He, hoops. So he was. A, he was he, 01, right? Yeah, he was a mentor. Like I just watched. Yeah. I watched Swaggu. Like you know, dunking with one hand. You remember? You remember that team? I play, well, he so he played with Carlos Hurt, who was a oh, great guard. Was, yeah. They were a class ahead of me, and we, I played for Boo Williams. So right. we we would play them at different Nike tournaments or whatever. Marcus was good. He Marcus was, could hoop. He was really good. Yeah. It was it was him and Carlos Hurt. It's crazy because Carlos Hurt just reached out to me and I haven't heard from him in years. He was like, I want you to come be part of my documentary. People don't know his story. Like for you to bring up Carlos Hurt, like that dude was like, he was that he's guy. Cool. Yeah, he was that guy. He was good. He was that guy. Dude, I've told this story on first take before. We were at uh, Colorado Springs for the USA Development Festival oh. and, and Braun was there was my first time. And I'd heard of Braun. Right. But he was there um, obviously the class below me, I think I, I was either just about to turn 16 or he was just about to turn, you know, or he was 15. I don't know. We were, we were, we were six months apart. So he might've been still 15 or he might've been 16. I can't remember, but we all kind of left to, we were getting ready to leave and we were kind of going around the room in the dorm and we we're like, what are you going to remember from this camp? What are you going to take back to your, you know, your hometowns? And Sean Dockery, who's from Chicago, was like, I'm gonna mm-hmm. go back to Chicago and I'm gonna tell everybody I just I just played against the best player ever. And I'm wondering for you, for someone that played against him even earlier than that, like what were your early impressions of Braun? Did you envision a <coughs> scenario where he would at that age be in the GOAT conversation? Yep. You did. I did. I did. And and I'm gonna tell you where it all like came out. It was it was like eighth grade, he was like, you know, six two. You know, you could tell he had guard skills. He was athletic, you know, but all of a sudden when we got in the tenth grade, tenth grade, it seemed like he just grew to like six six, six seven, two hundred and twenty five pounds, tatted up everywhere. Like who the fuck is this man child, right? Because you know back then we didn't we didn't have like social media or whatever where you could go or we didn't have cell phones where you could go on your cell phone and see where you ranked that and stuff. You actually had to go. I had to go to the library and actually dial up modem yeah, too. Yeah, and it was go a dial up yeah. AOL. Beep, yeah, beep, all that yeah. shit. Yeah, <laughs> trying to get online. <laughs> And then you go on a message actually, board. You go on a message board to see a ranking. And actually go see it. So for a while, for like six months, I had my glory. I was the number one player in 2003. And then LeBron James, I saw him at ABCD camp. This was our sophomore year. And I remember he pulled up and I'm like, bro, like, how you put on all this, like, this weight? He's ripped up. Tatted up, grew, look at me eye to eye. And I just remember, like, we were going to the 11th grade, and I just remember him tearing Lenny Cook ass up at ABCD camp. I think it was our 11th grade year, going to 12th grade. And I said, right. Well, Lenny then, was my class. So it was going into 11th grade because you guys for, were, for you guys us, were, yeah. yeah. So Lenny would have been then, a rising senior. Braun would have been a rising senior. Bro, he junior, was so yeah. mature. Like, I told this story once before, like, we all, like, you know, between AAU games and games, we didn't know nothing. I didn't know nothing about a diet. Hell, I still don't know anything about a diet, right? So I'm going to McDonald's in between games, getting a quarter pounder. We're getting fries and shit. We don't give a fuck. We young. This dude was eating bag of fruit, man. Bag of fruit. Like, he knew about nutrition then. And he was leaving and was like, hey, bro, where you headed? He's like, you, you ain't coming back with us? He like, nah, I got media training. It's like 16 years old. The hell you got media training? But he was already setting himself up and he already had the right circle of people around him that they knew like this 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 man was about to be great. And now when I see it and people are like, oh, Perk, you being biased. And I don't know if it's being biased or me having to actually be right there and witness the entire story of LeBron James. And that's what I tell people. Nobody had the most pressure for as an athlete in history, in the history of any sports, like LeBron James. 16 years old, labeled the chosen one. 
came into the NBA was is <clears throat> is video footage of older guys that were waiting on him, saying, "Oh, y'all hyping this guy up. He's not going to be this. He's not going to be that." And we here we are, almost two decades later, and this guy is still killing the NBA and still possibly could be in a conversation as being the best player ever. I mean, the best player in the league. Like, he never underachieved. And so when people talk about the GOAT conversation, I get Mike went to the finals six for six. But I'm looking at the story, and I'm looking at the pressure, the word pressure. And, like, to say he overachieved when he came into to the NBA with that much hype, I'm like, nah, that's the GOAT right there. Like, that's my GOAT. Hey, summer's here, and we all have some great outdoor plans. But what would make all of those plans even better? How about a lightweight, high-performing cooler, even one that can also double as a tabletop? Arctic Coolers is the answer. Need to keep beers cold while golfing? Done. Have to keep food and drinks cold at a barbecue or on a camping trip? Arctic Coolers simply get the job done. A cooler that's high in performance and durability is hard to come by, but Arctic Coolers, that's R-T-I-C, really figured it out with their products. These things are amazing, and there are several to choose from. I like the ultralight hard coolers. It's a premium lightweight hard cooler that can be carried by one person. It doubles as a step stool, tabletop, or a cutting board, and includes a removable divider and basket at no extra cost. I agree, the hard coolers are awesome, but I also love the soft pack coolers. They're super portable to take on any adventure. I just took one on my last trip, and it worked perfectly. They also have drinkware as well. Head to arcticoutdoors.com, that's R-T-I-C outdoors.com, for summer discount and deals, including free shipping of any order over $29, R-T-I-C outdoors.com. It's no secret that aches and pains can keep you from accomplishing your fitness goals. Well, now there's help. With new Plus CBD Pain Relief Topicals, say goodbye to sore muscles and joints and power through your workouts. Over the years, I've certainly had my fair share of injuries from the NBA grind, and I can confidently say that Plus CBD Pain Relief Topicals have been instrumental in helping me bounce back faster between workout sessions. That's because they feature a potent blend of CBD, menthol, and camphor to keep you pain-free and performing at your best. The Sport Recovery Stick is crafted for on-the-go use, which is perfect for anyone who needs it at work, on vacation, or pretty much anywhere you go while the penetrating pain cream is formulated to alleviate pain and discomfort. And don't forget to try the sleep gummies to help make restless nights a thing of the past. It doesn't matter if you are competing at the highest level or just trying to stay fit. The Plus CBD Sport Recovery Stick and Penetrating Pain Cream are the perfect complements to your training routine. Shop now at pluscbdoil.com. That's pluscbdoil.com. And enter the promo code JJ for 40% off your order. That's 40% off your order with code JJ. You guys, when you were, I want to get, uh, talk to you a little bit about your early career in Boston, but, but while we're on this topic, I am curious because you played against Braun when he was in Cleveland the first time. Mm-hmm. When you were with Boston, you guys had the big three. You guys beat them in the playoffs, I think twice. Then you played against him in Miami, when he was in Miami and you were still in Boston, didn't beat him. Did you see in that time frame, did you see a difference in his game and his mentality and his growth? Or was it more about him having the teammates that he had in Miami? No, it wasn't about the teammates. I think it was about LeBron learning how to complete the mission. And the Miami Heat and the culture – actually holding him accountable, right? Like, I don't know if you heard the story of, like, you know, him and Eric Spolcher, right? They didn't know, they didn't see eye to eye the first time, you know, the first year that LeBron was there. Eric Spolcher, like, called him into his office and was like, you got a fucking problem with me? He was like, here, you got a problem with me? And he had Pat Riley number written on the board. He was like, call him. Call him right fucking now if you got a problem with me. And, like, he kind of established, like, you're not going to, you're going to, I'm going to hold you accountable like everyone else, and I'm going to get the best out of you. That's when I actually started seeing LeBron James take a leap of actually playing defense and defending, not chase down blocks. We knew about those. I'm talking about actually defending, 
sinking and feeling, rebounding, doing the little things that matter. And I think he learned and he got the recipe from the heat and he took that on, along with him after he won. You know, he got the growth. He got the knowledge from Dwayne Wade and Udonis Haslam, you know, and, and Eric Spoelstra and Pat Riley. And I think that's what made him into the player that he is today. Did you have a – and you've seen him throughout his entire career. Did you have a, a moment where, like, you're like, this is peak – Ron? Every time I say that, he, he just keeps keep getting better. Keeps going up. Like, uh, bro. It's a, no, because it's, it, it's a, I was going to ask the same question, Tommy. But I, when I'm thinking about it, I'm like, has anyone had this long of a peak? No. Right? No. He just averaged 30 last year. Bro, I'm in my second, like, career. <laughs> we are the same age. <laughs> he is still playing. Do you do you realize in like seven, eight years, we both are going to be eligible for our pension? And he still, he averaged 30 last year. Like, he averaged 30. He averaged 30. Every time I say, oh, like, Braun can't, no, nah, he comes back even better. But I think, to be honest, I ain't going to lie, that Miami Heat LeBron was just different, man. Like that Miami Heat Braun was different. Like the Cleveland Braun early, in, even before, even when he left. No, I'm lying. That Cleveland LeBron when he came back, came back. That was that was that was different. Like what he did to the Raptors that year, when they had, I believe, the best record in the NBA or the second best record in the NBA. Like that dude was on something else. I think the the Miami LeBron still had the young LeBron athleticism. And he obviously still does. But right. I'm talking about like everything, right? Everything. He can still bounce out of the gym. But every possession could charge it up 10 out of 10. He had that in Miami. While he was in Miami, he became a really good shooter. Mm -hmm. And then the – I, I call, it was called it corporate knowledge, right? And then the corporate knowledge – of just being in the league for so long, where I think maybe I'm not I'm not not discrediting I'm not hating on Miami LeBron, but maybe those first few years in Cleveland like that might have been peak LeBron because he had everything tuned up with the mind, mm -hmm. the knowledge, the the ability to read the game, still had athleticism, but had developed into a really good shooter. No, I agree. I got a confession. Like, let me tell you so. We was playing. We played the K Cleveland Cavaliers in 2008, and it was a game seven, right? We just had lost game six. And I ain't going to lie, man. I was scared as hell going into that game seven against LeBron James. And this was the only time that I actually prayed that something happened to him at practice. I said, you know what? Like no no, what a, no what a thing to confess. I know, but I'm being real. Like I was like, let us get breaking news that LeBron has, you know, tore his ACL or something. Jesus. Like, I, I did, bro. Like I'm not even lying. I'm not even exaggerating. And I'm about I, I to edit this out. That, that no, no, you can't edit this out. This is real. That's how terrified I was of LeBron. Let me tell you, let me tell you. I wanted we got by the Hawks. And I remember it was game six in Cleveland. And he drove down the lane. And I think he dunked on KG and, and James Posey. And I seen it in his eyes because I was sitting on the bench. I had a horrible game. And I kept saying to myself, I was like, man, we're not getting past this motherfucker. He coming in here and he going to beat us. I could see it. And I was just, I was scared. I was like, this is a, a just a different dude right now. And I was scared. And I actually was sitting up there really praying that I woke up to some news that some type of way he was going to be out the game. What was I'm going to dial but real quick I guess I can't let this go. I'm going to dial it back. I'm going to dial it back for a second and maybe just say you were praying that he had a, a sprained ankle no, or no, that maybe he had a no, stomach no, no. bug. No, a, a stomach <laughs> bug or a sprained ankle, he still had a chance to play. <laughs> I did not want him to play in this game seven. And, and you know what's crazy? 
it took a lot for us to overcome and actually win that game seven that year. Like Paul had to have a – I think he still had like 48, 12, and 11. And like P.J. Brown had to have a big shot. Like it went all the way down to the wire. And and look, I tell LeBron this all the time. Like I always tell him, hey, look, man, you you like – he's really the chosen one. Like seriously. This motherfucker, everything he touches go. He win, He wins in card games. You know, he take everybody. Wins at life. Wins he, in business. No, everything. He's everything. Everything. But that particular year, I was literally praying on his downfall. <laughs> That's how bad I wanted to win. I wanted to win the championship. Just so we're clear here, because <laughs> have you told him this? I haven't, but he will hear this. <laughs> okay. And I hope he don't look at me crazy, but I actually was praying on his downfall just that one time. I did not want him to play. Like, if he could have got his ACL or whatever the injury was fixed the very next day and been okay, it's perfectly fine. Long as he didn't play against us. Did he like a really bad traffic jam? Right? Yeah. Well, Where I'm maybe his car breaks down. It's not like, like, it's not yeah, like, like, like <laughs> I wanted him to die. Like, I just said, we talking about an Touring injury. ACL is tough, though. Yeah, I had, tough. And guess what? <laughs> you know what's crazy? Let me tell you how calm it is. Two years later, I actually tore my ACL. That's how crazy it is. And I'm not I'm not even lying. Like, this is not a story that I'm making up. Like, I really, that's how bad I wanted to win in 2008. And that's how terrified I was of LeBron James going into game seven. Do you think do you think those your Celtics vets and those teams had a tough time adapting to the fact that he was taking over? I, I think they just didn't. It was like, you know how they, they have those old heads like KG, I love him to death. That's my big brother. But in his mind, he would always preach. And I, this is how I knew that LeBron was like a threat to them, but I would never say the shit in the locker room because we just had a golden rule never to appreciate nobody else outside the Celtics. Like if somebody dunked on one of our teammates, you better not have a reaction on the bench or it'll be a problem. And I just remember they would always say, Man, I'm telling you, Michael Jordan, they would just bring up random stories about Michael Jordan out the blue. And I'm like, why are y'all bringing this up? But they was bringing it up because LeBron James was actually leading the league in scoring. LeBron James had actually just won another MVP. So I kept saying, oh, <laughs> y'all feel threatened. You know what I mean? Y'all hear his footsteps. That's what it is. How close were those Celtics teams? Real close. Real close. Because, you know, there's obviously the story, and you told it on Woj's pod, I don't, a couple years ago, whenever it was, about when you got traded and you were in tears and Doc was in tears and Paul and Bro, KG you actually listen to me on Woj's pod? What? You you are really a student of the game. I just like, assume content, I'm learning bro. more about you. You going back and watching fucking <laughs> games in the 70s, 70s and 80s. You listen to the Perk or Woj part. I, I, but I, I, I'm, I'm curious. The reason I asked the question is because <clears throat> and I, I, I lived through it with Doc, with, with Lob City, where mm-hmm. – there's this this cycle that happens with the team. Yo. Where when you first get together, you're super tight and we didn't win. You guys won that first year. And the the further you go without winning, uh there's sometimes can be splinters, right? There come, there's 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 different factions of the team. I don't we, we weren't clicky, but it was just there, there's splinters in the locker room or splinters in relationships and you know, there were there's obviously stuff about Ray out there. Like, did you feel at the time though, before Ray left to go Miami, like that that was as close of a group as you had in the league? It was, it was. And I don't know what happened like after I left, but it fell apart. Like this is no lie, bro. Like we all spent holidays together at Ray house. Majority of the time, if it was like Thanksgiving or not on Christmas, because we played on Christmas Day all the time, right, with that team. But if it was Halloween, Thanksgiving, Easter, whatever it was, we was at Ray House 
in Ray's Boom Boom Room. Like it was called Ray's Boom Boom Room where he had his big ass theater, whole bunch of arcade games, all our badass kids running around the house. They and the, all the women upstairs cooking. We in, we in there doing whatever, watching football, and we eating good, vibing good. And I think when things started to go south, in my opinion, the first incident was when Ray – when Ray was pushing so hard to trade Rondo for CP3. And it got back to Rondo. And I think right there we started having a little friction, right? And we made Ray and Rondo actually box it out. <laughs> like they had so much beef, we we got to the practice facility. Um, we bought the boxing gloves. And they actually had to box it out because we just didn't want to have the tension no more. But I think um, it's really immature. I'm glad we got it back together now. Like Ray, you saw him at the Boston game. He went supported KG. Um, everybody's back on talking terms. I think it was very immature on a lot of people's part because they were mad because Ray left and went to Miami, but I think it was Ray's decision. Like, Ray felt some type of way about him not starting, uh, you know, the the role that he was starting to play. And I think he had just, his time was at war out, but I think it was because he went and joined the Miami Heat after the Miami Heat had just put the Celtics out of the playoffs is what rubbed everybody the wrong way. Right, and correct me if I'm wrong, there were some times that Avery started that year, right? Yep, Avery. I think it was times that he actually started uh, Jason Terry, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, and so, but Avery, I think, was the guy that was in Ray's spot, and he brought Ray, and Doc brought Ray in off the bench. Um, let's go back real quick, because um, I, I want to I wanted touch on this, because I'm very curious about it, and you and I have not spoken about this. You were one of the the last few draft classes or high school classes that could could leave out of high school and mm. come to the NBA, and you know, you know, I read that you had committed to Memphis. You ended up going to league. Take me through that a little bit, but I'm also I'm also very curious about you, this guy who grew up on a farm, plucking chicken eggs <laughs> in the morning, shooting squirrels. <laughs> yeah, that's <true. laughs> And then all of a sudden, you're 18, 19 years old in the NBA. I don't know if you're on your own in Boston, but that adjustment. <clears throat> so I go from living with my grandparents in a country town of about a population of about 70,000, Beaumont, Texas, on the border of Louisiana, right? And I go from eating fried catfish to shrimp fried rice to having Taco Bell, Whataburger, Jack in the Box on every corner to getting drafted by the Boston Celtics, right? And I was so country, and I didn't know too much about life that I bought a truck, a Denali, when I got drafted. And instead of my big dumb ass getting the truck shipped and me catching a plane and having my truck meet me there, I drove to Boston <laughs> <laughs> from Boba. Like, I literally got in the car and drove. And this is before you had, you know, you didn't have navigation. So I'm, it's me and one of my good friends. And a map. George a Davis. Physical map. Yeah, we had a fucking map. <laughs> and we drove, and he drove, like, we would drive until the gas tank would go from full to empty. We would take turns rotating like that. And so when I got up there, I'm like, all right, cool. We move into the apartment. You know, I had a townhouse. I never seen snow in my life. So it starts snowing. I got these big dumbass rims on my truck, right? Some big 26s. So I'm like, you know, I pull up. I got 315s in the back, music banging loud. I'm really doing it Texas style. You know, this is what I dreamed of. A big truck with big rims and speakers, okay? This is me. Snowing outside, my big dumb ass riding on, <laughs> riding in Boston, and I'm banging. 
I'm everybody, you know, all the vets kept telling, hey man, you might want to take them <laughs> them ribs and tires off your truck, you know. It's about to start snowing. I'm like, man, hell nah, I'm I gotta leave my shit on. I'm I'm you know, I'm cool. I go sliding off the rope, boom, hit a tree, right? I'm stuck in the snow, call Doc, you know, I get there. I called, no, Doc wasn't my coach. Jim O'Brien was my coach. So I called. I said, hey, man, I'm going to be running late. I'm stuck. Can somebody come get me? i get my truck later, right? Or we'll call a tow truck. So they come and get me. Jim O'Brien finds me $50 every minute. So I end up getting fined $3,000, right? And I'm like, what the fuck? And he was like, no, it's a learning lesson. One, you came in. You 324 pounds, your body fat is 24%. I was like, what through the hell that has to do with anything I just went through with my truck crashing into a tree? <laughs> but he's, he had been wanting to get this off his chest. He's like, you got your priority all, priorities all messed up. And I'm telling you right now, you got three months to show that you, that you really, really want it or your ass going to be out of here. So I'm like, damn. So I leave practice. I go get my truck, take them dumb ass rims off, <laughs> right? I take them dumb ass rims off, put some factories on. And right then, it was a, a switch that hit. Like, hey, dog, I got to get my stuff together. I'm not playing. I'm on I'm on the inactive list. And you know back then, JJ, T, like you go on the active list, you on the active list for, what was it, 10 games or something like that? five games. Five yeah, games, yeah. yeah. So I had to get my stuff together, man. But it was hard because I was used to my grandmother, like, washing my clothes, doing all that. And now when I was going to the grocery store, I'm just getting waters and Gatorade. Until I find out I get home, I don't have toilet paper or paper towels. Little shit like that that matter, which made me grow up. But I will say this. People always ask, like, did you regret not going to college? And I said, no, I don't. I heard so many stories about people that went to college and had these experiences, and it was it was the best time of their life. But I always said, man, nothing gets you ready for the NBA like being in the NBA. But my college experience, as far as like me going on the college visits, was everything. John Calipari was the coach there. I remember he he flew up his private jet to Beaumont, Texas. We had a small airport there, right? He flew his private jet in, picked up me and one of my teammates named Keena Young that ended up going to BYU. Flew us in on the private. You know, I ain't gonna spill what else he did, but it was all good. I ended up signing I, I think what you, I think you just spilled something there. We, you know, we'll talk to John. Yeah. We might have to edit that part we can out. Draw, we can draw our own conclusions. <laughs> I'm not sure that was entirely legal. But you know what? Memphis already got sanctions. It's fine. Well, right. yeah, Memphis it's already fine. got sanctions. Right. Yeah, I mean, that was that was 20 years ago. It's it's fine. Fine. <laughs> I was going to ask you about uh, the Thunder years when when James got traded. What was your initial reaction? I thought James was the most selfish guy in the world. I really did. Like, I, I wrote James a big-ass text message, like a long-ass message, and I just went off. I was like, bro, you selfish as hell. Like, man, we had a, we got a chance to do something special, like lose my number, motherfucker. You know, I, I'm cussing him out and everything. He responded and said, it's all good, man. I got a lot to worry about right now. I got to carry this team. I'll holler at you. That was his was his response, but I was hurt because I didn't want it to like at, at at that point I already knew like I'm not making any All Star games like I'm a I'm a role player and I already had accepted my role and so when James left I didn't understand it at the moment because I was thinking about myself and trying to win more championships that. This young man was nothing but 23 years old. Like, trying to go accomplish making the All-Star game. Trying to go get $100 million for us with his contract. Trying to go make trying to go make 100 to 150 plus with his shoe money. And here I was being selfish, not thinking that he had individual goals and shit that he wanted to accomplish. And I should have been supporting that. 
Where are you guys at right now? I mean, we was cool. We we got back on point a little bit like five, six years later. And then all of a sudden when I got in the media, I said something. You're a hater. You turn, I, it, you turn back into a hater. Yeah, I turned back into a <laughs> fucking hater. And all of a sudden he got mad at me and then we got cool. And now I guess he's not talking to me no like right now. I don't give a damn. I, I always fa- found it fascinating that – that trade because again he was he was uh extension eligible mm-hmm. like he wasn't a free agent they didn't have to trade him you guys had just made the finals i don't i still don't understand why they didn't just play the year out because what happened was sam Presti actually gave him to 12 o'clock i remember it was it was like a wednesday he was like you got 12 o'clock to sign this i believe it was like a $64 million extension. Was 52 is what I heard. No, Maybe it, was like, it, was yeah, it was like 64 And James was like, I want the max. But what ended up happening was, was when James, Katie, and Russ all went to the Olympics and they won that gold medal, everybody like LeBron, D-Wade, was gassing up Carmelo, was gassing up James saying, you need your own team. And they wasn't gassing him. They were right. He actually did need his own team. But at the same time, they was trying to break the Oklahoma City Thunder up so they could win more titles. Yeah, I mean, I I played against James when he was with OKC. I I knew he was good. I had no idea that he was going to be that good. I did. You did. I did. You saw that he could be an MVP someday? (laughs) Bro. He used to bust Russ and KD ass at practice, including me. Like, I started five, James used to give us work. And I saw a few times where, like, he had 40s off the bench. One time we was in Utah, he came in off the bench and had 40. We went to Phoenix, he had 40 off the bench. And I'm like, people are just not having 40s off the bench and you playing with Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook. Like, those guys are taking 30-plus shots by themselves. So for you to come into the game and have 40, you have to be elite and special. And then I saw James, I said, it was during the playoffs, and I remember it was game four, and we was playing the Dallas Mavericks, and we was about to close them out. And he went for 24 points in the fourth quarter. And the way he did it, I was like, nah, he got that franchise. was the game. That was the game when I I knew that he wasn't just like a good player. He was a great player. Yeah, it was that game. I, mean, remember, I, I that? remember that game so well. He, yep. In pick and roll, that fourth quarter, operating out of that, it was a closeout game too, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. It was a closeout game, and I was just like, okay, he's he's great. I, I still didn't know he was going to be, you know, first team All NBA over and over, MVP, all that stuff. Um, incredible career for him. Do you think um, James trade aside because it's a big trade? You think there's anything they could have done to get them over the hump that they should have done? Nah. I mean, I I just think it was more so um it was all about KD and Russ. Like it was it was about their relationship. Like that continuity wasn't there. You know what I mean? Like no matter how much they tried to fake it to the public their 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 brotherhood like it never was a brotherhood and that's okay right because you don't have to be somebody brother to go out there and try to win a championship but it helps but they never just got on the same page and it was like the most difficult situation I've ever been in uh coming from a Celtic team that was so close that when I got To the Oklahoma City Thunder, it was so separated, right? Like you had Eric Maynard, you had Russell Westbrook and James Harden. Those guys all, and Daquan Cook, like they had their little click and they kicked it with each other. And then you just had KD, who was just by himself. He didn't even hang with them. And so I started to see it and I'm like, hold on, we can't win like this. Not where we trying to go. And I started noticing that when we went on the road, I'm thinking, oh, we're going to have team dinner together. We didn't have that. Like, KD was going his own direction. Some of his boys would fly down along with his brother. They would do their own thing. 
And then these younger guys, so I'm like, hold on, I got to come in the middle of this. It was to the point where their families wasn't speaking. And I'm like, hold on, we got to like kind of change this environment. And so I started like forcing, forcing it. Like I would put those two guys, Katie and Russ, in a group message and I'm like, fuck it, I'm going to start off by talking football. KD was a Redskins fan. Russ is a Cowboys fan. I'm a Cowboys fan. Let me start talking shit. Had made them start interacting with each other. Then I'm like, you know what? Let me have a card game in my house. Sent everybody in the in the in the in the on the team in the group message. Hey, look, be at my house seven o'clock. We gonna play Ray. On the road. Hey, look, man. No more bringing your family members. We gonna kick it with each other. We're going to dinner at 6 o'clock. We're going to come back. We're going to watch these games on TNT. We're going to play Boo Ray in my room. Like, I had to start forcing it for them to fuck with each other, but they never really fucked with each other. They did it just because, but it wasn't authentic. And I think that's where KD and Russ go look down the line and say, you know what? We really had something special, but we didn't embrace it. And that's going to be a sad thought. Before I let you go, you, you mentioned Boo Ray. What's the most money you've lost in a Boo Ray game? Well, you played that shit too? I'm obsessed with it. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Me too. I had to, I really had to get myself under control and get help. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to, I started, I started bringing it home where I would have my family members and we would play Boo Ray, not for the. For like two bucks yeah, or two 25 bucks. cents or whatever. I, yeah, I just yeah, wanted yeah. to play. Like we would, it got so bad. It got so bad in Boston, bro. We were playing before games in the locker room. We were playing before games in the locker room. Who got a deck of cards? Fuck, let's get a couple hands in. Like, especially against trash ass teams, we were playing before <laughs> games. So the most I ever lost, I lost the pot for like sixty five thousand dollars. But, but I was already up. We all were. Yeah, I was already <laughs> up. I was already up. But I ain't gonna lie, man. When we was in the finals and we were going traveling to LA from Boston, we had a big Boo Ray table. It was called uh they had big Boo Ray and Lil Boo Ray. Right? The Lil Boo Ray table was forty dollars Andy. That was like Tony Allen, Big Baby, Eddie House, like they formed their own table. But then they had the the big boy table. And you had to show fifty thousand in order to play. That was KG, Ray, Paul, James Posey. So what me and Rondo did was we combined twenty five thousand a piece, and we played one hand together. Mm. You know what I'm saying? That's how we did it. That's a good way to do yeah, it. Yeah, that's how we did it. Because yeah, KG was it. trash. Like KG <laughs> would stay in with a king. What I hated. What I hated. <clears throat> About how much you lost? I'll tell you in a second. Hold on. <laughs> I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> what I hated about long road trips was, especially like if you were in Boston, I was in LA. Right. And long road trips generally are on the East Coast. So you have that five, six hour flight to your first city and you're playing. Yeah. So you might go up 10, 20 grand. You land in that city, you're like, man, you're feeling good about yourself. And listen, you got 12 more days of playing. You got, and you All got of a sudden, play. by the end of the trip, you're down 15 grand. And you're like, oh, shit, man. Tides have turned. And Most you got ever a, lost of one flight was 15K. And you got but it was play. all winnings. I, I'll be, I, I'm not just making that. It really was all winnings. But, yeah. I, but I, was, I ended up down for the trip. But you got to play, though. Oh, you can't get out of the game? No, you can't get out of the game. That's the the game. Rule. You can't but be I, like, I'm up 20, I, I'm out. We talked about this before uh, in Philly. Did y'all ever have any crazy fights because of the games? Did we? What? You talk, look, bro, I don't know, T, I don't know if you recognize this, but I think you could see it now. We had some crazy motherfuckers on our team that was <laughs> thrown off, starting with me. Right, so I just want you to think about this for a second. Like, let this sink in. Think about Paul Pierce right now, okay? Just think about it, okay? You, can you visualize Paul Pierce right now? Yeah. He's a little thrown off, wouldn't you say? It's okay. I'm thrown off. He's thrown off. KG, right? He's a little thrown off. Big Baby, right? He's a little thrown off. Tony Allen, he's a little thrown off. 
We had so many fights, you wouldn't even imagine. Eddie House and Big Baby had a fight in my room in San Antonio <laughs> while we were playing Blue Ray. It was crazy. Like, I, I got fined. Pictures, TVs got broken. Like, we had fights. It, and it was okay. It was okay. It's part of it. It's part of it. There's a lot of things I miss about the NBA, about being a player. What's that? Know? No, there's a lot of things. Like, I miss the competition. I miss being in a locker room. I miss being on a team, you know, like that. You talk about that camaraderie, that closeness you felt in yeah. Boston. I'm lying if I say Boo Ray is not one of the three most important things. Bro, that I miss, I miss that shit so up. much. I, I'm I trying to tell so you. Much, I can't. I, I be. I be hoping like people invite me I know. to Boo Ray, but now it's like people play guts. I tried to get my my whole family came and visited me for Thanksgiving. <laughs> like I got my nieces and nephews and you know, my brother and sisters. You know the I'm one like, thing. Yo, we should. I'll teach you guys how to play Boo Ray just to get some action, bro. Man. You know the one just thing. Just to I'm, get some. You action. know the one thing I'm loving right now is the first thing that you have to do when you have a problem is admit it. And that's what me and you doing. We both, <laughs> we admit right now to the public that we have a problem. And I, I do, man, I'm telling you, people, I, I used to tell people I keep ace, king, queen in my back pocket. Mm. Mm. You're like, you're one of those guys. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just, I think back, there's two feelings th th specifically with the game. That feeling when you get dealt ace king, right? So you got the ace king of the trump. Yo, you before, the before you say how many. And obviously, you want. ace king queen, you won. You right, won, the, right, you won right. the hand. You're probably going to boost somebody. But ace king, like off, off the deal. And yeah. you're like, oh, well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one is when it's your money in the pot because you already got booed. Yeah. And you get dealt the cards and you're like, oh shit, I don't have any trumps. And you take five. And you get back like the seven of the Trump yeah. and you're sitting there and you're like, oh my God, I just got to get a book. I just got to get, gotta get a book. You got to get a book because you're trying to two, two, one it. That's the only thing That's you want to do. That's the skill in the game. Yeah, it's two, two, one it. We should do a tutorial. We're going to do I a YouTube tutorial of Boo Ray. I'm trying to this. tell you, hey, it's the best we thing. It's the best game. This. It's the best, best game. game. Perk, this has been awesome, man. No, appreciate, I appreciate you. I appreciate you. I sipped on my wine. I'm going to give you a quick cheers. It's been awesome, brother. Appreciate y'all having me. Yeah, thank you. Y'all keep up the great work.